I think what we're going to try to do here, uh, given all the speakers, they all get five minutes to answer the first question and then we're done. <laughs> um, some of these will come from the audience, some of the, most of these are questions were, were dreamed up by the, the graduate students who were organizing this symposium, which uh, hey, they've really done a great job. Um, so, um, one question that, that, that everyone seems to have on their minds is the question of triage and how do you choose, how do you, how do you make decisions about which animals you protect and which ones you don't. So the question is, if the Endangered Species Act and funding stays the same, how, how can we deal with all these extremely small populations? Do we have to resort to triage or some other kind of prioritization mechanism? Um, and if so, how? Um, <laughs> so, uh, next question. Next question. Yeah, I, I, I deal with this all the time, so I'm, I'm very interested in your answers. So anybody want to start with that, or should I just start with Phil and work our way down? I think I'll let someone else. Uh... <laughs> Who wants to do a prioritization question? Oh, I think I'm kind of covering what our students are doing at this point. Um, I don't think that we should give up on any species, but we have to take the opportunities as they show up and then try to be strategic with what we have left in terms of where can we apply our funds to get natural benefit for those species. It's uh, not a matter of trying to say, if we're done with that species, we're giving it up, but we have to look at where the opportunities that come up on and make the most of us. But I think the, quite the point of the question here is, is that re in reality, can we, can we make deal with all the species, really all the non-listed species, somebody just has to make a choice of which ones to list and which to not list. Uh, at some point we're making choices and, and we, is there a systematic way to do it, I think is part of the, the, the question. Uh, I think if you're, if you're thinking about listing and even some sort of covered planning, um, a lot of different people are making that decision. The service has its own scheme, court settlements have dictated some of the scheme and directed the service to do other activities other than what they would prioritize. So there's, I don't think there's necessarily one overriding plan at this point. So should there be one? Anybody else have a response to how you... Yes, go ahead. Public thoughts. First, that did triage now. It did tell you the expenditure budgets, uh, any endangered species program, that's a de facto triage. Second, I think the, the public agencies probably have the unenviable responsibility of having a reasonably well thought out and well articulated uh, protocol for deciding roughly uh, what species get money and what amounts. Having said that, it's always going to be clouded by uh, Political considerations, largely controversy. When controversy arises, regardless of where a species is in anyone's uh, priority list, that's where money will go. And then the third thing I would say is, for the rest of the world, yeah, people should think through in terms of their own uh, actions, giving whatever organizations are with the organization's priorities, rationing how they want to spend it, and I think it would be pointless try to um, mesh all those different uh, mm -hmm. techniques because we'll never agree uh, <laughs> on whether we ought to be bad at evolutionary uh, distinctiveness more than its potential role in the ecosystem, more than uh, its aesthetic appeal. And for that reason, I sort of have to let a thousand flowers bloom and form some knotted mass vegetation <laughs> out of that. I'm probably going to get about as good a job. So, Lisa, uh, would you mind giving giving that a shot? Because you represent the uh, uh, the legal profession and the outside world, so to speak. Uh, sure, I'll just represent everybody. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think that I, I actually agree with what's been said, but I think there's also opportunity cost, and I think just the reality is that certain species, because they are more charismatic, are going to get more funding dollars, or because they have some commercial value. Um, they are going to get more funding dollars. And I think I have to do this every day in my work. I have people calling me literally every day. Oh, you have to do something about this. Oh, you have to do something about that. Oh, there's a situation. Every single day. And, and you 
have to decide what you can do and what you know what the limited amount of money or time that we have can do. If those are opportunity costs, because if I try to work on too many things, I'm not going to do a good job on any of them. So I think for, for the center, we try to um, focus on species that have um, more of an ecosystem basis, like umbrella species are very important, uh, or species that are indicators for their own um, ecosystem. But but we're also not charged with, with actually going out and saving the species. That's what you guys have to do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only charged with trying to get the legal requirements in place that will help do that. But it, I don't think this is an easy task. But I would say looking at ecosystems is ultimately going to have more bang for our buck and, and those kinds of things. So does the, does the Center for Biological Diversity make any di discrimination between plants versus vertebrates, for example, or bugs versus uh, vertebrates? It's, it's no, we work on, on all species. Uh, we have a whole uh, spring snail thing that we're doing all over Nevada and in other areas. And we, we get a lot of flag for it. I mean, we, we do a lot with invertebrates as well. Yeah. We do think that each of these species has value in our area. And I think the spring snails are an interesting um, idea because a lot of people don't really think they're not very you know cute or charismatic I guess but um, they they do again they, they're an indicator for a whole set of ecosystems. So anybody else have any, any comments on the triage question? Well, I just, in Wyoming, I know what we've done a couple things in terms of sort of prevention preparatory uh, the triage or at least provide funds when they're happening. We set up. Um, Wyoming Wildlife and Natural Resource Trust and I was uh, trying to put in 225 million, I think it is, and put that up as a corpus and then try to live off of the interest that comes on and use that money more in a preventive way and somewhat in a triage way. And the other way we've done is the governors and the switch governors have gotten aggressive on something like the greater safe grouse executive orders, again, as a prevention, preventive way, rather than as a triage, um, to hopefully avoid being triage. That would always be desirable. Um, well, related to this, then, is the, uh, the idea of genetics, um, which are um, Essentially, the, the modern genetics is showing us there are an infinite number of small, small population segments out there. Uh, you know, it could be it could be a DPS under the um, uh, the ESA, you know, the, the lizard with one gene that gives it a, a a white coat, a white skin rather than a brown skin. Um, so the question becomes: This is partly biological, but it's also partly, um, I think, social and so forth. Is that where do we draw the line? Uh, in a way, it's about, about what's the species. But where do we draw the line in, in protecting distinct population segments? Uh, and, who, and, and who makes those decisions? Because obviously with genetics, we can go on and recognize um, distinct populations that may be a freeway dividing the population in half, and even in, in 20 years, they've diverged. So where do, who do, who, where do we draw the line? How do we define a distinct population segment? That would be one way to put this. And uh, who does this? Anyone have any? Well, I might start with, sure. with a, a controversial opinion, which is Good. that. Um, we like controversy. <laughs> that from the perspective of evolution and from the perspective of conservation, that it makes a lot more sense to think about populations than species. Um, and that we have lots of different ways that we can delineate mm -hmm. populations. And, similar to what people have talked about in terms of defining conservation priorities, mm -hmm. that we just have to choose which criteria we're using and be explicit about that. But we, there is no one way to define a population. It depends on whether you're talking about bacteria or plants or animals or, you know, I mean, there's so many different axes. Anybody else have any comments on that? Because obviously lawsuits oh, hang oh, on these oh, kind oh, of the things. Way, actually, yeah. I, I've been, uh, I spent many years defending the language of the ESA that allows it to list subspecies and distinct population segments. I'm no longer sure that was uh, a smart move. I, I actually think, given the vast number of species 
all species by the most reasonable criteria that are disappearing, at least as a national policy across public and private lands, you probably ought to be focusing on species and then considerations for protecting subspecies populations can either reside with various land management agencies and with the states. And I, I think we basically burden ourselves uh, too much by actually trying to encompass all of that under the umbrella of the Endangered Species Act and our increasing ability to detect differences with genetics is only going to make it uh, an even more uh, difficult task. But you know, biologists um, are increasingly, there's a tendency to now want to describe species using the finest division that you can make because it does make a difference whether something gets protected or not. So is there a responsibility on the part of the biological community to somehow come up with a definition of species that people can agree with <laughs> or something similar? Great question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, I wouldn't want the uh, decision left up to the states. Uh, coming from Arizona, <coughs> it's a very conservative state as far as protection. You know, so the Mexican wolf probably wouldn't be protected under the current administration and fish commission. So, and you know, the Florida panther is a subspecies. Yep. And some people would say that it's not even a distinctive subspecies because it doesn't have genetic variation, but it is protected under federal law. And so I think you lose these, uh, this protection if you relegate this to states. And I don't know what would have happened in Florida. But Fish and Wildlife designated animals with Florida panther ancestry as Florida panther, even if they're half Texas cougar. Um, this other situation where I don't know how much difference there are between the white sands population and blizzard nearby, but I, I've worked on the spirit bear recently, which is a black bear in British Columbia, which uh, has a white coat, it's a recessive gene. It seems to be one nucleotide difference. Uh, there's on the order of four to five hundred of them. And there's a lot of people in British Columbia that want this to protect. And I certainly think that there's multiple reasons, I, whether it's difference uh, ecologically. Some people claim that it can fish for salmon better than black black bears. <laughs> you know, so it may have some difference that uh, you know allows it to be ecologically successful. I mean, I'm not sure. But so it's even though there's there's subtle differences on a molecular level, something like that may have some sort of uh, uh, ecologically important uh, ancestry to give us to that, that, uh, that situation. Just one follow-up yeah. comment on yeah. those things. So I think one thing that's pervasive in the um, kind of philosophy of species literature is the importance of separating our, our concepts of what is a species or what is a population from our criteria. So we can debate a lot about kind of the philosophy of what is a species, but when it comes down to it, we need to have criteria that we can be explicit about. We are implementing this set of criteria in this particular um, situation. And I was last week at a, a talk where a biologist explicitly said, I study you know, coral reef fish and I am just naming everything as species because I'm a conservationist and I want everything to be protected at the maximum level possible. And that seems to me like a very objectionable scientific approach. Um, but he was clear about his criteria. He said that you know, my, my philosophy is that the species is this, but the criteria is that I name and everything under the sun that I can tell apart, right? And so I'm not advocating that, but I'm advocating being explicit about kind of the criteria as a separate issue from our philosophical, so philosophical opinions about how we want to draw circles around biodiversity. Any, any other comments on that? It's actually, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think you know, the, the triage concept is important within species as well because um, for a variety of reasons that we identified a few of them here, animals are being moved around in their, on the landscape more now than they ever have been. 
And so it's just a, a very practical concern as well. Um, you know, managers, conservation biologists, <coughs> we need to uh, we have, we need to develop good guidelines on can we move so the bulldozers come to this site, you know, desert, you know, and blanket desert to put in solar panels, right? Well, can you relocate? You're going to relocate those tortoises or whatever? How far? Where? And and, 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 and how many again? So how how fine? How how thin are we going to slice the uh, the definition of PSU? Um, and if it's uh, to go too fine grain, then we've lost our management tools, right? Well, well, Deborah gave actually you you had an example of that with the plants where the plants in different reserves were genetically slight, uh, different enough so you decided not to mix them. Uh, but what would happen if the bulldozers were coming to that second reserve and we're going to plow it under? Would you still be would you be willing to move mingle the two again, or what would, how would you handle that? And actually, that's not a hypothetical. That was the case. Um, the reason that we were approached about uh, being a recipient site for that population was that it needed to be translocated or bulldozed. Uh, fortunately, with plants, we often have more options than we do with animals. Uh, we collected seed <laughs> on that plant, and the seed had a pretty long shelf life. Uh, so we do still have that population, even though it is now under cement in the wild. <laughs> Um, we have the seed, in fact, some of them are still around the refrigerator. Um, <laughs> ideal uh, situations. Um, so we have some breathing room uh, to make that decision. The seeds have been uh, designated for research purposes or to be used in restoration purposes for open space areas that are closer to that source population as opposed to our population. But it, this actually gets into a, another question that's, that is on here, is which is the role of hybridization uh, in species protection? Now, this, there's an example. If you brought those two forms together, isn't there some chance that you would be improving, you know, since we get hybrid vigor or something like that going on with those, with the plants? Is that, but is that the kind of thing that, that we should be doing more with endangered species? Well, I agree in the hypothetical, and I think, I don't know where we start to begin to develop a principle about that. For me, it's a very case-specific decision, uh, given, and you have to consider the risks. Um, so one of my considerations as a manager would be, uh, so we were concerned about the recipient population, and I think that's an important consideration when you're, there's a potential hybridization event, you're concerned about the uh, translocated population and the risk to it, and in that, this case it was extreme, but also the recipient population. There's a risk there. There's a possible benefit. In our case, there was probably no, in our particular case, uh, there was probably no uh, reasonable benefit to the recipient population because it was not, it was not highly threatened. It was doing fine. Uh, so in this particular case, we balanced you know, the risk to the transplant population and the risk to our population and decided, you know, it's more important to maintain what's healthy now than to present a risk of genetic contamination, especially since we've got the opportunity to keep it in storage for a while. In other situations, the risk may be different. There may be reasons to believe that there's um, lack of serious lack of genetic diversity in the recipient population. So then you would weigh the risk differently. Well, as I understood it in this, this one, it wasn't just that there was genetic differences between the two sites, because I think that's almost a foregone conclusion, right? That's the criteria that we would never do. But you did a common garden experiment and you found evidence for local adaptation. And so, you know, that's, that's a criteria that makes sense. It's when you're just working with genetic, uh, genetic variation, which is obviously important, but it's, just, it's harder to figure out where to draw the line. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm not all part of the idea that generally the expectation is in these sort of gene flow, genetic exchange between populations across space and as selection going across space will in the future look at adaptation and degrade that level of adaptation. But there are exceptions to this, and it's a matter of understanding is it in the class of one of those exceptions? One of the major exceptions is when you have like a highly variable population sizes such that you go through bottlenecks or occasionally need demographic support, or also variability in your environmental conditions at the time, as opposed to more stable environments. Under
understanding with whether or not there's an instance of one of those exceptions or one of the ones that fits under the broad paradigm of genetic exchange of a well, the, but the problem with small populations is that too often we're thinking we want to put them on small reserves and think of them as museum specimens almost. So, uh, and yet we're in a world where it's changing very rapidly, the climate change, everything else. So, how do we direct, uh, uh, should we be in the business of directing evolution? These small populations of selecting for traits. We already are. We already are. I know that's the, that is the reality. But should we be doing it in a more deliberate basis? Really thinking about this. It's, I mean, really, to me, the way we're doing it mostly now is setting aside chunks of land, keeping the critters on there, and saying we hope to make it. We really have a choice other than that. I mean, maybe a few species. In new with fish. But <laughs> <laughs> from most places, you know, they um, Lang's metal bar. All goes well as what you say, but it is where it is. And, and I almost think it's pointless to try to figure out if we should create a corridor to allow Lang's metal bar to move through uh, uh, the disturbed habitats around it, or for that matter, to find a way to be single presidio manzanita if it's way over the Golden Gate Bridge and kind of you know find a spot in the rim uh, in, a, in, in anticipation of the response to climate change. I, I think fundamentally to an unpleasant extent for the foreseeable future we are locking in where a lot of mm -hmm. the rare species are going to be. We're playing, we're putting all the chip on um, basically one number, one color on the uh, table, and, and that's it. Um, it's not a great situation to be in. That, I think, is one of the real sad outcomes when things get that rare. Uh, and if I'm being overly pessimistic <laughs> on that, which I hope I am, I do see that folks tell me you know, where, where the greater options are given constraints on money large number of species. Mm -hmm. But we heard the example of the native endangered butterfly feeding on the exotic plant. <clears throat> now in the fish world that happens all the time. Um, so, yeah. and do you think we could undertake a captive breeding program on that butterfly to select first um, uh, variants that do better on some abundant, widely distributed wheat? Yeah, no, I, I think we can do that. We can, um, Another option that we haven't talked a lot about is translocating species uh, way out of their range to places where we think they'll thrive. There are more red crowned parrots thriving in Brownsville, Texas, than there are in the native range in Tamaulipas, Mexico. Uh, and so we could envision um, you know, a day when the best population uh, black rhinos are in Texas and things like that. <laughs> That's kind of revered. Um, yeah. <laughs> the, the point being that we can do that, and, and we probably will do that, but it's only going to be a small percentage of the imperiled species. It's not going to be a strategy we can employ uh, wildly and, and, and in, for a lot of species. And there's where there are going to be some real triage decisions to be made, uh, given the cost of the process. And I think we also have to make pretty intense human involvement. We remember our lessons from cases where, say, we tried to engage in biological control and it went terribly wrong, um, to cases where you are protecting the capacity for evolution mm -hmm. to take place. And think using our principles from basic science in order to protect that capacity. Um, I, because the more proactive you get, we have this potential to do more harm than good. And so we have to be pretty certain about the science when we get to something we might call directing evolution. <laughs> and we never probably never really felt together. I was going to talk about Mexican wolf for a minute here. Uh, uh, Mexican wolf, I showed you the historic range, and it went uh, all the way up to northern Arizona, northern Mexico. But it didn't go all the way up 
And uh, one of the, uh, I've been on two of the Mexican wolf recovery teams. This is a long process. Uh, they still don't have a recovery plan. And one of the ideas was to have uh, two populations, in, one in northern New Mexico, one in northern Arizona. So that's out of what we'd call the historic range of the Mexican wolf. But one of the arguments made is maybe now with climate change, maybe now that we know that Mexican wolves take elk, you know, that's their main prey item, that it's completely appropriate to have them further north. And I guess the other thing that is uh, related to what we're talking about here is that some people have historically, uh, northern gray wolves uh, and Mexican wolves were continuous uh, throughout the Rockies. And so now we have a big gap between, say, Yellowstone and around there, and Mexican wolves have been reintroduced. Some people have suggested maybe we should cross Mexican wolves and northern gray wolves, because this is going to be the, what happened in history, you know, not, not too long ago, 150 years ago, that there were wolves all through there, at least to maybe help out, some people say, the Mexican wolves, uh, maybe to get a head start on what may happen in the future as well. So, you know, both of these things, you, know, you end up having all kinds of controversy, and some of this is from people that are obviously against wolf success, in my opinion, and some of it is kind of cautionary, some of the things that we're talking about here. And we really want to do this, this is too experimental. If it happened naturally, maybe that would be one thing, but do we actually want to move Mexican out of their range? We want to cross them with another subspecies, maybe that's uh, beyond what we should do as a management protocol. Everybody agrees with that, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah, th these, 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 these are great, great questions to work with. Um, I'm going to switch here because I have a card here that would be negligent if I did ask at least one question dealing with economics. Um, and uh, it's, the question here is, in the age of shrinking government budgets and constraints on payments of fair market value for land, Please suggest how we might implement agglomeration bonuses. So I think that's a question for our economists at the end of the table down there. <laughs> well, the way that we envisioned it was to think about how much we could spend on an acre of land if you're trying to retire it, and then give you that amount up based on getting the person to Higher the land, so the more value, the cheapest land you can offer up in this whole uh, landscape. And then partition it out based on whether I'm touching my own acres that I retire, or whether I'm touching the acres of the south, or whether I'm touching the acres of the north. What we're trying to do is drive everybody to the fence line voluntarily. And so we're spending the same amount of money, but we just parse it, you know, parse it up and put a string on it, not a really big string, but a string that says you can earn more money if you come to the middle. Or in some cases, maybe if you want four corners, you know, you want different prairie dog populations, you would punish them if they came <laughs> against the, you know, you take a subtractive subsidy. But what's so different about this idea is that you're making the payment, the, the conservation easement, or the farm bill payment, to me, dependent on what you do. And typically, that's not how we do it. What I do is what I do, and I get my money, and that's my money, and I can do the same with you. But now, we're actually making a neighbor dependent. But if that's the goal, is to create bigger corridors, then, then, then that's the rule. Right? You, know, you can get the same amount of money if you're being asked to make some adjustments, and but nobody's forcing you to do it. You like less money or more. That's okay. Um, and uh, that's how it worked in my theory. <laughs> right? um, now, actually, getting it to happen is another story because as you start doing it, it, you 
get people who are really smart and know how to use the system, they can hold out. So we can work together. You can hold out your land value go up because now okay. you're right next to um, a nature reserve. And so we've got endogenous land values that can also change the picture. But you know, I think it's worth trying in some place. Somebody, somehow. <laughs> Hey, well, so many comments on this. Obviously, one of the one of the problems with nature conservation is certainly is the values of key pieces of land do keep going up, and and the landowners are smart. They know this. They know if a land is especially valuable for conservation, then they are going to try to maximize their value out of it. Um, I don't know if there's anything revolutionary that can be done there, but uh, it's certainly an issue around here. And, well, I would just comment that we do see this all the time, and um, in the desert recently, as someone mentioned, there's you know all these new solar projects there, and the land values for private land to be purchased have gone way up. And we also just had a new legislation going into effect on the national level that that only applies to the Southern California deserts, where um, grazing allotments can be retired for conservation. And yeah, the. The people, the allottees, are very smart. They knew it the minute it happened, and some of them were already in options, and yet they're pulling out and saying, no, now it's worth twice as much or whatever. So it is it is a, a, a game, unfortunately, uh, to some extent. On the other hand, we have these social values. You know, if we want to put in renewable energy in these areas, and, you know, there's a debate about that, whether it's more appropriate in distributed areas in the already built environment, but the extent that some of these large projects are being built, we need to mitigate for them. Is the mitigation even out there, and can we make it happen? And uh, you know, I think the the agencies and the counties and the federal government are are getting to a point where they're a little bit stuck because it's costing a lot more than the uh, companies thought it would, and yet it's required to mitigate. So, <laughs> so do we have any solutions? <laughs> Because mitigation lands are a big deal around here, and there's a lot of, and, the, and there, and frankly, there are a lot of people out there. Not a lot, probably landowners who think they can make a lot of money by selling, using their land for mitigation credits and so forth, selling it off of land that's not, not very good for what it's supposed to be mitigated for. But if somebody approves it; it's okay. Um, that's an editorial. Yeah. <laughs> um, Okay, uh, uh, another switch in questions, um, which is, it revolves around the word adaptive management, which uh, those of you are probably familiar with that, it's a jargon word, no, that means taking risks, um, that you treat, treat in a, uh, a conservation effort as an experiment and hope to learn from it. And so the question here is, is it possible to use adaptive management as a way to deal with with a data poor environment when talking about extremely small populations, how do you deal with the bureaucracy and the risk? Uh, and maybe Josh, I could I could start with you since <laughs> you know agencies are perceived as being reluctant to take risks uh, of that sort, where you might might have to run almost like an experiment on some endangered species in terms of managing their land, burning it, and you don't really know if it's going to work, for example. I think that, that and getting back to one of the other things that we've heard about it, it comes out of politics. I think the agency will be a lot more willing to try stuff when it's not with the wolf, when it's with Baker's Marksman. Um. Yeah. Um, because it's in our most diverse agency in some ways. And so we can take risks with species where we're not under a microscope all the time. We do. You know, we are collecting seed. We are pulling the Francis to get the out of the ground. We did pull in Lake's Melbourne for capital population. And these are places where we are taking the risk. These things could go. And it's harder to do when there's a lot more public controversy stuff. So you, okay, good. Yeah, I, yeah, I think it's a tender exception to the exceptional circumstances. We, we can't afford not to do that. Definition of those, you know, learning from your mistakes and, and progress. And uh, there is a way to be uh, somewhat more risk averse while doing adaptive management. I mean, so, you do adaptive management, you can't treat everything the same. You can't 
clearly I think that kitchen soon can change everything at once because the number of variables impact the results of the population response. But um, but you can do manipulations, and what you can do, for example, is have like, you know a group uh, sit down and talk about the you know, expert opinion on what they think might work. And when's the last time you heard a group of experts agree? <laughs> so you take those different plausible uh, managing strategies and you test them against each other. You don't have control that you think is going to actually you know, wipe them out. You have you know one version of what you think is going to help. You know, have a favorable population response versus another. You can test those against each other. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, 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 a more a, a risk averse strategy of that management. And I think we can't afford not to do something like that. And that's what you whenever we make progress. Experimental design should be incorporated into that. It doesn't necessarily mean high risk. And I think, I mean, we actually have examples of this, like with the reintroduction of the Great Wolf. It wasn't clear whether it made more sense. Or would these family groups that would be the most coherent. And so they tried different things in different locations, and it turned out both worked about equally well, if I remember right. Um, and so it's certainly done with these, when we're dealing with these types of uh, factors, it was locally extinct in both locations that would be produced. But are those more the exception than the rule? Do you have situations like that? With the, with the, the idea of using an adaptive management program, uh, a program that includes experimental management, whether that's more, um, whether that's the exceptional situation. It's not the SOP. Yeah, I, I don't have an answer to that one. <laughs> um, well, as far as Mexican wolves, I think there was supposed to be an adaptive management idea being implemented, but this led pretty much the paralysis. You know, the Arizona people opposed doing anything. Fish and Wildlife wasn't really pushing them, maybe because of the controversy that it would cause. So uh, it was all sold as adaptive management, but it really wasn't implemented that way, in my opinion. And so we've ended up with nothing being done for five years now. and. Uh, no recovery plan, no movement of animals. So, you know, adaptive management, if it's implemented properly, I don't know how to safeguard that might work, but in this case, it, to me, it's a complete failure and manipulated by the people that were really against uh, recovery of Mexican wolves. And some people, sometimes people will label trial and error adaptive management. It's, mm -hmm. it's not the same thing. Exactly, and I just want to underscore that. I just some of, some of I've heard some folks use um, the excuse of, I didn't get to it last year because of blah, blah, and that's adaptive management. I'm going to do it this year instead of last year. Uh, but, <laughs> <laughs> but contrary to what I might have been seemingly saying about needing species-specific information and needing population-specific information, I also am a clear advocate of the other side of being extremely careful and um, so I think of it, I guess I frame this discussion not so much as adaptive management as risk assessment towards successful management and not just immediately taking an experimental approach to getting information. I've seen what I think are some, is gross negligent under the rubric of, of adaptive management or getting species specific information. Examples where I think experimentation has been used when the principles of biology would have clearly given a sufficient answer and instead placed the species further at risk. Uh, to me, a good example was uh, just exhaustive counting of individual plants of where the species is an annual plant. And after exhaustive counting of individuals in the orders of thousands over a five-year period, the conclusion is that this annual plant species varies annually. <laughs> <laughs> there is no one in this room that would not have known that without the intensive monitor. And that is not a hypothetical situation. That is reality. So it's monitoring, not adaptive management. But it was used for the idea of understanding the species better and being able to better use, then that use that information for management purposes. So it, yeah, how do you 
but just I think that this is a really rich area for discussion and exploration and benefit to conservation. One of when can principles be reasonably applied and when do we need to seek information uh, in a more invasive and, and costly fashion? I think it's a hard conversation. But in fact, I, I don't know how many years ago I was in a room with maybe some of you and somehow the topic came up that there should be this, um, oh, I know what it was, a former graduate student of some professor was in the room. <laughs> and this former graduate student said, dear professor, can you help me? I am the only biologist in an organization of, let's say, engineers, and they're all telling me this. And I know on the basis of these <coughs> principles that they're wrong, but I can't convince them because I'm one amongst many. And decisions are being made sort of democratically instead of biology. And that person was looking for a support group at UC Davis and saying, can't you put together a support group of biologists who will help work through this tricky territory when it's okay uh, to use principles as opposed to specific information? Because they're not going to believe me unless I have species-specific information. So, you know, maybe that's an idea to, to consider. But. Okay. I mean, Jason, yeah. Overlap, probably the, one of the biggest areas in economics, not in endangered species or conservation, but in questions of poverty and development, have been randomized control treatments and adaptive management. And the work that people have done out of the Action Poverty Lab are essentially this, but they're used typically in education, healthcare, um, different empowerment schemes for. Children. And probably there's no reason why the same tools that we're using to look at other aspects wouldn't be implemented into what you're doing as well to learn more about getting more of what you want. Any other comments on adaptive management? I yeah. Keep going with that. Sure, <laughs> no, go ahead. I'll give you two other quick examples. Um, and I think there's, um, in uh, particularly in the regulatory context, there's a bit of tension between um, monitoring and uh, adaptive management. And I think because of the, you know, it's not the, the, the intent, but a lot of the biological opinions uh, that they will have a target population size. Um, and so uh, the, the species I'm thinking of right now, uh, California these terns, um, there's a lot of money from counting terns. I mean, you have to see every every nest, you know, five four times a week, things like that. It's in the biological opinion, and so they've been doing that for 15 years, you know, counting terms. Um, <clears throat> whereas, um, and they're also doing management, but they don't have the resources to test. You know, I mean, they're doing you know, five, six, and seven different things, and some of them, I mean, it's working. The populations are doing pretty well, but we really don't know what works and what resources we really need to apply. And so in that tension between monitoring and management and, and science, I think um, we can do a lot more subsampling uh, population estimates and get away from trying to know. I mean, population size isn't that relevant. It's what population trends. It's stable and increasing and decreasing. So if you can take bold man management actions that are within, you know, management actions that are already happening, which you manipulate. For example, they remove vegetation cover for eastern nesting. Well, um, we're working with the Navy now to design an experiment, testing different levels of it, and see what works, so that the resources are allocated towards the most effective and efficient way that's going to increase uh, nesting success. So you would take resources away from monitoring to put yeah. into adaptive management yeah, program? Yeah, well, there's $700,000 worth of resources to annually to monitor Camp Hamilton and Coronado. Well, yeah. not many species have that much money available yeah, for you. <laughs> and if you look at pandas in, in, in China and any embarrassed brood, you know, you're lucky if you can see 1% of the population in a lifetime, right? And then, you know, these, these birds, you see them, you know, four days a week. <laughs> <laughs> All of them. Wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, it's a great soapbox. Um, <laughs> 
speaking of soapbox, this is another chance. Um, this, is, this is a question. Assuming the political climate is friendly, should we, we revise the Endangered Species Act? And if so, how would we do it? <laughs> Making the assumption the political climate is friendly. How, how, how would you revise? Should we bond into the realm of science fiction? <laughs> It's a, it's a, actually, it's a serious question, but we, we do have that fundamental problem. Nobody wants to mess with the ESA right now because if you, you get into that box, you get a little ways and somebody's going to blow it up. But um, if, we, if we have the option of making it work better, what would you do? Especially in the, in the, for small populations. So how do we resolve that issue? I mean, money is always the issue. Always the, seems to be the problem. Is there, uh, do, are any optimistic that the public's going to turn around and suddenly want to devote large sums of money to that kind of monitoring? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to my mind, it's a, the, the fundamental problem with the Endangered Species Act, which is arguably an uh, insolvable one, is that it is a law that inflicts concentrated pain on a small number of individuals to produce a widespread diffuse benefit. Which means that we go beyond this room where we have people who are deeply committed to uh, biodiversity, the public at large, the benefits they feel from California leased terns and uh, mountain yellow-legged frogs and things is relatively small. But to the particular landowners who are uh, affected by decisions on that, the pain is intense, the anger is intense. Conversely, the types of laws that are the most durable do just the opposite. They provide concentrated benefits to a few and very diffuse pain to many. We have the big agricultural subsidies. All of our pockets are picked, but to a small amount. <laughs> and then a relatively small number of people reap huge benefits. Those people will go to the mat to defend those laws. Those of us whose pockets are being picked because it's a relatively small amount in the big scheme of things, we're not up in arms about that. I've never figured out Let's how you can, <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've never figured out how you can turn that around and still protect endangered species. Um, and I think that structural problem will continue to make protection of endangered species and small uh, populations a scenario whereby the Defenders of it are going to feel embattled because they're not going to have the legions of supporters they want, and they're going to have very fierce opponents. Wow. Any other comments on that? 
Because um, what, you know, what, one way of, look, of, of trying to justify these things is to say ecosystem, the um, ecosystem services can be tied to endangered species. If you save the species, you're really providing clean water, uh, your carbon sequestration, whatever. Does that argument hold up? The smaller the population you're trying to save, the less likely you are to be able to produce substantial ecosystem services. I mean, what was that, that one pool of blue flower on the highway? Yeah, I don't want to argue about carbon sequestration. <laughs> <laughs> it's one little bit at a time. <laughs> well, that actually relates to maybe so, can we give, give me this last question, which is um, uh, the idea of using a single species, especially those with small populations, to save less rare species as a as the keystone species for larger preserves. Is this something that is this really effective? The question I actually have written down here is: Do you think it is effective to use single species of small populations to drive conservation on a larger scale? Sometimes. After <laughs> <laughs> uh, a quick case study. Um, uh, the Chinese government is not necessarily always the most you know, um, environmentally advanced um, policy makers, but uh, uh, in the last 10 years, um, we've gone from 10 panda reserves to 63 panda reserves. And uh, the bamboo forest in which pandas live is one of the most biodiverse temperate um, uh, ecosystems there is. So I think that's a, a good success story for the mm -hmm. economy. Conservation symbol in giant pens, but I'm sure there's good spaces for this. Work less than that. Well, let me give you a, I mean, sort of the main book on adaptive management and economics and thinking about development. Um, here's the list. If you could hook small species up to these, I mean, you've got here in business. Um, inclusive growth, peace building, agriculture, and rural development, labor markets, and employment, labor, region, social protection, social security, then micro credit plus insurance, nutrition, health programs, education, empowerment, organizations, and poor property rights reform. Those are the things that on the agenda of the World Bank and the IMF and the people who are driving big sort of development decisions on uh, emerging economies. If we're worried about endangered species and small populations there, that's that's what you're gonna have to link up to to get the votes. What about you? Um, healthcare, nutrition, <laughs> education, insurance, <laughs> jobs, um, agriculture, rural development. There's a lot of jobs in county Each, po each small population needs at least one steward, right? <laughs> but so how do you link those things up? That's, that's the question. Is that, and and um, are you suggesting we should all become economists? Or we should train more economists who are... No, well, I'm suggesting you should hang out with us more. I mean, 
and condo recovery, one of the main issues up to now has been lead, and we can't get people to stop using lead bullets, even though there's, you know, a complete, you know, it's very easy not to use them. There are other things you can use. The cost has come down. There's no need to use lead bullets anymore. This is the main thing that is inhibiting that population at this point, both the, the listed population and the 10J, which is sort of listed. Um, and we still can't get that change. And, and people love Congress. So I, I don't know. I, I can deal with that. Well, David has well, well, yes, it's part of the range of California and still lead poisoning is the leading problem with Congress in California. And yeah, there's no enforcement. David, you have it. I wanted to, in sort of this conversation, just mention what I think is a paradoxically optimistic uh, framework here. Paradoxically, because I think the structural, the sort of fundamental structural problems with the ESA that I talked about are real. I think the political climate isn't going to improve greatly in the near future. Uh, and the financial situation looks bad for I think, quite a while. But having said all of that, it is amazing to me. The act passed in 73. There have been numerous occasions when Congress has revisited it, reauthorized it, it's long overdue for reauthorization. Throughout that time, the act hasn't really been fundamentally weakened. No. They haven't taken away the ability to protect plants and invertebrates. Um, they have put in various uh, provisions to allow development to proceed, the HCP provisions in the face of uh, conflicts of endangered species that weren't there uh, originally. But even those have been more or less to direct the process that was already underway. People were already making those trade-offs. So the act Curiously remains surprisingly strong as a piece of legislation, and notwithstanding two decades of attempts to seriously weaken it, it hasn't happened. I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. Not only that, there has been in place there's a statutory ability for the Secretary of Defense to waive the Endangered Species Act at his or her discretion. There's an exemption process that would basically allow a project to go through, notwithstanding the fact that it would drive a species to extinction. And yet, the decision makers have been always deeply reluctant to use those provisions. There's a real inherent unwillingness on the part of leaders, even hostile leaders, to sort of have the blood on their hands for that sort of thing. And I think this, oddly enough, persists and ought to be viewed as a, uh, a source of encouragement uh, for all of us, even as we face the very huge obstacles, scientific, political, economic, that lie ahead. Well, that's a great way to end. Um, <laughs> we have encouragement in fact.